Second World War is remembered as one of the bloodiest conflicts, full of complex military campaigns, air operations, and massive naval engagements. However, what most people don't know is that it also saw a successful pirate war, carried out by German auxiliary cruisers that terrorized Allied ships across the Atlantic, Pacific, and Indian Oceans. These German raiders voyaged throughout the whole world and battled in the most exotic of locations, like Madagascar and the Galapagos Islands. Yet one of their most important theatres of operation was in Australian waters, where war was breaking out for the first time. Welcome to our video on the German raiders of Australia and their pirate war on the Pacific Ocean. If you want to learn more about the history of the world wars, you've got to check out the sponsor of this video, Magellan TV, our most loyal partner and an excellent documentary platform. Magellan TV is a documentary streaming service run by filmmakers that has over 3,000 documentaries, among them hundreds of historical documentaries. We're excited to announce that Magellan is now offering gift cards, allowing you to get yourself or the people you love the gift of knowledge. Now's the time to try it and share this excellent service with your friends and family. Magellan TV has a phenomenal selection of historical documentaries on various topics, and being a member of Magellan TV is a must for anyone who wants to learn more about World War II. We used their documentary playlists, World War II Battles Won and Lost, and Lost Battlefields of the World Wars in our research, and both are excellent in their coverage of the battles, campaigns, leaders, and strategies of this global conflict. You can watch both anytime, anywhere, on your television, laptop, or mobile device, and it's compatible with most devices. The best part is Magellan TV is offering a one-month free membership trial to our viewers. If you haven't signed up to Magellan yet, Support our channel and do that at try.magellantv.com slash kingsandgenerals. You'll get a free one-month membership trial. As the war broke out between Nazi Germany and the Allied nations in September of 1939, the commander-in-chief of the Kriegsmarine, Erich Rieder, knew that the British Navy was far superior and acknowledged that he was only capable of waging a trade war against Britain's maritime commerce. The successful efforts of the cruisers Admiral Graf Spee and Deutschland at the start of the war proved that British trade could be disrupted, but these cruisers only managed to operate for less than three months before being detected. So while Germany prepared for invasions of Denmark and Norway, Raider was covertly building a fleet of auxiliary cruisers to wage raider warfare on a global scale. These cruisers were commandeered civilian vessels converted into warships that looked ordinary enough to remain undetected and had such high endurance that they could sustain commerce raiding on high seas for a long time. Raider carefully handpicked captains with unconventional thinking and an exceptional fighting spirit. By March 1940, these cruisers were deployed on the Kiel Canal to train and make their final preparations. Meanwhile, Raider assigned operational areas to his raiders. The cruisers Atlantis and Penguin would operate in the Indian Ocean, while the Thor and Vida were assigned to the Atlantic, and the Orion and Comet to the Pacific Ocean. On March 31st, the first of the German raiders, Atlantis, departed Schleswig-Holstein disguised as a Soviet freighter and then successfully entered the Atlantic. A week later, Captain Weyer and his Orion departed through the Denmark Strait, heading towards Cape Horn, before entering into the Pacific en route to Australian waters. During its voyage through the Atlantic, the Orion sank one freighter and crossed Cape Horn by May 21st. On June 13th, the German raider, disguised as an anonymous Dutch Africa Line freighter, entered into New Zealand waters with the objective of mining the Horaki Gulf under the cover of darkness. After laying 228 mines without being detected, the Orion flared at full speed towards the Kermadec Islands, stealthily waiting for prey to appear. A week later, they heard of their first victim. The Canadian passenger liner Niagara carrying eight tons of gold ingots and arms ammunition. With the sinking of the Niagara, the war entered the South Pacific. In response, New Zealand closed all ports, stopped all maritime trade on its waters, 
and sent minesweepers to the Haraki Gulf. That same day, Captain Vaya also spotted a Norwegian freighter, the Tropic Sea, and managed to capture it without a fight. In the following months, the Orion's remaining mines would cause only one more sinking, eventually breaking free from their moorings and drifting, yet the operation was largely seen as a success by the Germans. For the Australians, this cruiser was a great menace, so a hunt for the German ship was ordered. At the same time, the German raiders Pinguin and Comet completed their trials and cautiously departed from Gottenhafen. Remarkably, Captain Eisen of the Comet would voyage for the next two months along the frozen Northeast Passage, headed to the waters near Australia and New Zealand. The Orion, meanwhile, met with the German tanker Vinito south of the Cook Islands to resupply, but also to give them the Tropic Sea and the prisoners they had captured to take back to Europe. By August 4th, the Orion had managed to slip off New Zealand waters and entered the Coral Sea, headed to the passage between Brisbane and New Caledonia. Twelve days later, the German raider intercepted and sunk the French steamer Notto, capturing its sailors. Then, Vaya headed to the Tasman Sea, where the Orion experienced its first naval duel against the New Zealander freighter Chirikina, sinking it in the process. The Australian Navy was now alerted to the presence of enemy raiders, so maritime trade was suspended. Cruisers Perth and Achilles were sent after the Orion, but the raider again managed to disappear. To the dismay of the local populace, the war had reached Australia for the first time. In early September, Vaya decided his next move would be to drop a series of dummy mines off the coast of Albany to disrupt maritime shipping in the area. Yet his efforts would be futile, so he would disguise his ship as a British freighter and then turn back to rendezvous at the Marshall Islands with the supply ship Regensburg. On October 10th, the Orion was resupplied by the Regensburg, and four days later, the German raider sunk the Norwegian Ringwood. Furthermore, the comet had arrived into the Pacific, so Vaya met with Captain Eisen at the Caroline Islands and proposed they work together. Eisen agreed, and so the Far East Squadron was born joined by the supply ship Kulmaland as a scout. In October, the squadron started to patrol the waters east of New Zealand, where they sunk two New Zealander ships and captured more than 300 sailors and passengers. In the face of a probable new hunt, the squadron fled northeast at full speed and then headed to Nauru to attack the enemy phosphate industry, which was crucial for the agriculture of the British Empire. Meanwhile, Captain Kruder of the Pinguin finally finished his voyage through the Atlantic and Indian Oceans, during which five enemy ships were sunk and one was captured, and then headed southeast towards Australia, planning to mine their home waters. In late September, the Pinguin reached the island of Java and started to patrol the Sunda Strait route in search of an enemy vessel that could be captured and converted into a mine layer. On October 7th, Kruder's search would end after the lookout spotted a Norwegian tanker south of Christmas Island. The Storstad was then peacefully captured and converted into the mine layer Passat. Now Kruder planned to get near the east coast of Australia before mining the approaches to Newcastle, Sydney, Hobart and Adelaide, while the Passat would mine the Bass Strait. In late October, the German raider entered the Tasman Sea and a couple of days later, the Pinguin laid 30 mines near Newcastle and 30 more near Sydney before fleeing towards Tasmania. On the night of October 31st, Kruder left behind 50 mines southeast of Hobart and on the Dontracasto Channel, while the Passat successfully completed its mining operation on the Bass Strait, where it placed 80 mines across the area. On November 6th, Kruder dropped the last 40 mines on the gateway to Adelaide. Six days later, the Pinguin had already fled to the southwest. In total, 230 mines had been laid in Australian waters by Captain Kruder's ships. Their first victim would be the British freighter Cambridge, which struck a mine and exploded on November 7th. Two days later, the American city of Rayville was also destroyed, 
the first ship of the United States to sink during the war. The mine sunk three more vessels in the next few months, successfully disrupting maritime trade around Australia. Once again, the Australians started an unsuccessful hunt for the German raider, but the Penguin had already escaped back into the Indian Ocean, continuing to wreak havoc on British trade, sinking four more enemy ships. By December 5th, the Far East Squadron had reached Nauru. Eisen planned to attack four ships of the British Phosphate Commission, while a landing party was going to destroy the island's infrastructure. Disguised as Japanese freighters, the squadron approached Nauru and spotted one of the phosphate ships, the Triona, approaching it as well. The Germans moved to intercept it, and on December 6th, the Triona was cut off and attacked. With a distress signal jammed, Triona surrendered and was then sunk by torpedoes. The following day, the Comet started to scout the waters closer to Nauru, where they spotted the Norwegian vessel Vinny, waiting for better weather to load phosphate. Eisen approached the ship and managed to sink it without being detected. The German cruiser then discovered the three remaining British vessels northeast of the island. Once the Comet finished its scouting operation, Eisen and Vaya rendezvous to prepare for their offensive. The Comet would head north of Nauru, while the Orion and Kulmaland would approach from the south with the objective of attacking any shipping on site. Also, the plan to land a shore party was abandoned due to bad weather. At first light on December 8th, the attack on Nauru commenced with a naval engagement between the Orion and the Triadic, in which the phosphate ship was sunk and their crew was captured. Nearby, the Triaster heard the gunfire and started to run off, yet it was rapidly intercepted by Vaya's cruiser, which opened fire without warning. The Triaster then sunk, with its 63 crew members captured as well. Meanwhile, the Comet spotted the last remaining phosphate ship, heading at full speed back to port, and successfully jammed its communications. Then Eisen's cruiser fired upon the Comata, wounding and killing several crew members. The survivors were captured while the vessel was sunk. On Nauru, the bad weather had prevented the British garrison from witnessing the fight, but some men still managed to see a burning wreck. The Australians were then alerted that the German raiders were in the area, but with no warships nearby, they couldn't act to help the Nauru garrison. The Far East Squadron's attack on the phosphate industry of the island was thus an utter success, but Eisen still wanted more. After refueling on the Marshall Islands, the Comet and the Orion returned to Nauru to launch a land attack on December 16th. However, the water remained wild, and so the idea of a landing was finally dropped. The most important concern for the Germans now was the 675 captives that took up too much space on their ships. It's worth mentioning at this point that the German raiders across the world treated their prisoners in a very humane and thoughtful way, taking care of all their needs and trying to bring them as much comfort as possible. So on December 21st, almost 500 captives were released on Emerau, despite the chance that they could provide useful intelligence to the enemy about German operations. That same afternoon, the Far East Squadron disbanded, with the Orion heading northwest to the Caroline Islands for repairs, while Captain Eisen managed to mine Rabaul and then bombard the oil facilities of Borneo, a prospect that would have to be dropped due to engine problems. Instead, the Comet would head back to Nauru, as Eisen was still obsessed with the idea of destroying the island's facilities. On December 27th, the German raider reappeared off Nauru and warned the island garrison not to use their wireless communications. As Nauru was practically undefended, the authorities complied and started to evacuate. Then, Eisen proceeded to bombard Nauru's phosphate piers and oil tanks, causing significant damage to the island's industry. Finally satisfied, Eisen withdrew to the southeast, successfully avoiding Australian warships. The German captain would be promoted to Rear Admiral due to his astounding success, and he would be ordered to continue operations on Antarctic waters with the objective of hunting enemy whaling fleets. On the other side, the Australians were deeply concerned by the two subsequent attacks on Nauru, so they started to concentrate their ships in home waters, 
with the objective of protecting shipping. Meanwhile, the Orion would unsuccessfully remain in the South Pacific until early March, unable to raid due to the increased Australian presence in the region. For the next few months, Captain Vaya would continue his service on the Indian Ocean, capturing one more ship before finally returning to Europe. After 510 days at sea, the German raider managed to sink 13 ships, with a combined tonnage of 87,555 gross registered tons. The Antarctic voyage of the comet would also be fruitless, so Eisen decided to head back to the Pacific en route to the Panama Canal. On his way, the German raider met with a German whaler, adjutant, which was ordered to mine the waters around New Zealand. On June 24th, the adjutant would lay 10 mines around Port Littleton and 10 more near Port Nicholson. These mines didn't claim any victims and were most likely defective, so New Zealand never found out about this operation. The German raider would next sail to the Atlantic Ocean and then to the Galapagos Islands, sinking three more ships on its way before heading back to Europe. After a voyage of 516 days, the comet managed to sink eight ships and severely damage Nauru's phosphate industry. The last raider to step into Australian waters would be the Cormoran, captained by Detmers, which arrived in the Pacific in early August 1941. The German cruiser spent over a month zigzagging northwest of Australia without any success at spotting enemy ships, which alerted the RAN of renewed raiding efforts on its home waters. Captain Detmers then returned to the Indian Ocean, where the Cormoran sunk the Greek freighter Stamatios Gamma Empiricos before returning to the South Pacific by early November. On November 19th, the German raider, disguised as a Dutch freighter, entered Shark Bay with the intention of mining the western coast of Australia, although the Germans would unexpectedly run into an enemy Perth-class cruiser coming their way. A clash was unavoidable so Detmers ordered all men to battle stations. Despite the HMAS Sydney's overwhelming superiority in firepower, the Germans held the advantage of knowing they were going to fight, whereas the Australians had only encountered an unknown freighter. But first, Detmers tried to avoid a confrontation by tricking their foe into thinking they were the Dutch freighter Strat Malika. To attempt this ruse, the Cormoran had to approach closer to the Australian cruiser, with the additional advantage of getting into a better position if a fight broke out. Meanwhile, Captain Joseph Burnett of the Sydney considered the Cormoran's behaviour suspicious, but didn't really think a German raider would be in such remote waters. The Germans also tried to delay the identification procedures, and all this allowed the Cormoran to get as close as 900 metres to the Sydney. In the end, the Australians asked for the Strat Malika's secret signal so they could confirm their identity, a signal that Detmers didn't have. Now a fight was truly unavoidable, so the Germans decided to take advantage of their proximity and aimed at the enemy's weapons and critical points. Just as Burnett noticed that something was off and started to order action stations, Detmers ordered the Kriegsmarine flag to be raised and to reveal the guns and anti-aircraft cannons carried by the German raider. This took between 12 to 18 seconds, so once everything was ready, the German captain ordered to open fire. The Cormoran's first salvo fell short, and the Sydney immediately returned fire, although they missed as well. The German cruiser then fired back, this time hitting the Sydney's bridge and control tower. At the same time, the Cormoran's secondary armament rained fire on the Sydney's upper deck, anti-aircraft guns and torpedo batteries, preventing the enemy from returning fire. Then the Germans loaded their torpedoes and launched them against the Australian cruiser, hitting again at the bridge and the control tower, probably killing Burnett and the other officers there. In response, the Australians tried to return fire with their turrets, yet they missed all of their shots. Soon, almost all their turrets were struck and disabled, and their seaplane was also hit, causing an explosion that started a large fire on the midsection. With its last two remaining turrets, however, the Sydney managed to explode the raider's funnel and oil bunkers, causing a large fire in the Cormoran's engine room. 
Once all its turrets were incapacitated, the Sydney, engulfed in flames, turned south, trying to escape back to port. With their engines disabled, the Germans continued to fire upon the Australian cruiser until the Sydney disappeared into the distance. That night, the Sydney's damaged bow suddenly collapsed and the cruiser rapidly submerged. The Cormoran had sunk the pride of the Royal Australian Navy. Still, Detmers recognised the damage he had received was too severe and ordered to scuttle the cruiser and to evacuate on lifeboats and rafts. Most of the Cormoran's crew, some 312 men, managed to survive and were later rescued and captured by Australian vessels, while the 645 sailors aboard the Sydney perished in the struggle. After 351 days at sea, the Cormoran managed to claim 12 ships with a combined tonnage of 75,111 gross registered tons. Overall, the German raiding campaign dramatically slowed down maritime trade in the region, damaging the economy of the British Empire more than was expected from such an inferior navy. Our series on modern warfare will continue in the coming weeks, so make sure you are subscribed and have pressed the bell button. Please consider liking, commenting and sharing, it helps immensely. Our videos would be impossible to make without our kind patrons and YouTube channel members, whose ranks you can join via the links in the description. To know our schedule, get early access to our videos, access our Discord and much more. This is the Kings and Generals channel and we will catch you on the next one.